Chris Oatley's ArtCast, Episode 72, Why Freelance Artists Fail, with special guest Sean Hodge, editor for FreelanceSwitch.com and TutsPlus.com. Part 2. Hello, my friends, and welcome to another episode of Chris Oatley's ArtCast, the show that goes inside the hearts and minds of successful professional artists. I'm Chris Oatley. I was a visual development artist at Disney until I quit and started my own online art school, the Oatley Academy of Concept Art and Illustration. You can find more art instruction, resources, and career advice from some of the most inspiring voices in animation, games, comics, and new media at chrisoatley.com. That's C-H-R-I-S-O-A-T-L-E-Y dot com. Even the most successful freelance artists will tell you that bad clients and boring gigs are common roadblocks to a fulfilling creative career. The popular blog known as Clients From Hell posts a new, true, and hilarious freelance horror story almost every day. Even the legendary Drew Struzan struggled with the client side of his now famous career. In the recent documentary about his life, he told a story that was actually painful for me to hear. But bad clients are so common, and the stories so egregious, that it's easy for artists to remain blind to a hard truth. That we, the illustrators, are often part of the problem. I've worked with many freelance illustrators and designers over the course of my career. And I've noticed three common problems that sabotage freelance success. In this second half of our two-part interview, freelancing expert Sean Hodge shares insight into how you can avoid these common problems and attract better clients with better business practices. So let's talk about why freelance artists fail. And the first question that I have for you Sean, is not really a question. It's uh, more of an idea, and I just want to get your thoughts on it. Um, But I hear from frustrated freelance illustrators all the time, and they're frustrated often because they can't get the gigs that they want, the clients that they want. And occasionally, I have time to click their link and go see their portfolio. And all too often, what I find is a portfolio full of to put it bluntly, the microwaved leftovers of uh, uh, an illustrator or a style that is currently in vogue. Do you find this to be true? Uh, And if so, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Well, first of all, I think that's just a hilarious metaphor. Um, I think, (laughs) (laughs) I think it's particularly true for illustrators more so than other professions. And I'll give some reasons why. Graphic designers typically live in this sphere of microwave leftovers. I mean, we're all sharing and we're all pursuing trends and we all have a feel for different trends that happened in the last few years or what fits a certain client look. We kind of have to live in the skin of other design work, you know, whereas it doesn't mean that you're not, you don't have some level of voice there's certainly a lot of your personality that goes into it and can go into it but if you were put on you know like google's team as a designer you would adjust to their voice i mean that's part of being a designer a graphic designer whereas an illustrator people approach illustrators for their style and vision yeah so if you're just trying to be just like some other illustrator you know, like you're saying a microwave leftover of what they've created, you're not developing that unique thing that is you. I mean, you haven't just gone deep enough into that hole of your own developing your own style. But as a, as a, a student, you should copy other people. I mean, outright copy right. just until you, you can draw in that style and then do it a million times. Mm-hmm. And, just, just do that and then develop that nuance that feels like it's you, but in that style. And then eventually try to pull it together, man. Like, you know, pull these threads and what does that thread create? Plus you, plus 
what interests you, you know, and, and that's, that's where you come up with something that's interesting, you know, and, and that's why people will search you out. And at the same time, as you're developing your business savvy, it doesn't mean you don't pay attention to trends. I mean, ideally your style and what you do, it meets with what the market's looking for, you know? So it, you kind of have to pay some attention. Oftentimes I'll get these portfolios that are torture <laughs> bleeding from the eyeballs and, and I'm going, maybe there's an industry for that, but I've been doing this for a long time and I've never seen that industry. And maybe that's just because I don't hang out in places where people are into that kind of thing. But it is possible to be so doing your own thing that it's not relevant to anybody or it's not relevant to enough people to be able to make a living. Yeah, don't don't go off on a desert island and just make your thing and then expect it to be relevant in the marketplace a year later. Yeah, there's that line between, you know, commercial appeal and, you know, companies that what they're looking for and then what you can produce. And, you know, that that line where you're unique, but you're also working in a certain vein and there's a certain demographic you're looking to hit a certain type of of work, man. Yeah. So if you really want to work at Disney, then you really got to produce stuff that's in line with that right now. So during the Renaissance, we had the master apprentice model for art education. And you as the apprentice would go work under the master craftsman. And at some point you would attempt a masterpiece. And then that masterpiece would be evaluated by the Guild of Master Craftsmen. And if you won their approval, they would allow you to join the Guild of Master Craftsmen. And then you got to go set up your own shop and have your own apprentices and so on. There's a lot to like about this model. And although I'm sure it was full of frustration for the apprentices and the master craftsmen, uh, any, anyone who's been to graduate school knows what it's like to try and convince a group of traditionally minded master craftsmen of the validity of your own new ideas. Um, but what I like about this model is that there's a clean break, a rite of passage, a clear point at which you are birthed into the world of creative professionalism. Nowadays, I think there's a huge problem in that getting your career started is in a T-bone collision with study and creative growth. Now, we should always continue to grow and we should always continue to study. But when you're in what should be sort of this cocoon phase, the student phase, the the art school phase, whether you're actually in art school or not, it's hard to get good enough to be professional when you're already worrying so much about being professional and you were already worrying. You shouldn't worry about your portfolio freshman year. Do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's that's another issue. Not worrying about your portfolio freshman year. But this this idea of the um, the master apprentice, um, my dad's a machinist that's part and parcel to the trade. I mean, it's huh. changed because it's gone digital and everything, but for, I don't know, the hundred years of manufacturing that CNC machines were out there and lathes and drill presses and mills and all that. I mean, that's how you learn. You, awesome. know, you, you did a couple of years of trade school and then you were taken on as an apprentice and that's how you operated for two years until you were considered a I don't know what the term is, but it may be a master machinist or something like those terms. But yeah, I mean, most professions operated that way and they, they do to an extent. I'm sure once you came on at Disney, there was like a a period I'm guessing, I'm sure there was a period where you were kind of an apprentice, Uh, Uh you know, for me in blogging, it was kind of like that. I mean, I was running sites, but you know, running them with Collis, the the main guy behind Envato, uh, you know, being able to reach out to him and ask questions and, you know, really doing things his way for the first two years before I started doing things my way. And then we've grown in a team that's like that, you know, now we have kind of a a team way, plus everyone's got their own experience to bring. How can you emulate that now? I think is a big question because it's not necessarily required. Um, You know, something like the program that you offer is awesome. I mean, you, you have the experience, you have done it. You have walked that path you have. And, people can come on and get all that experience from you. And, yeah. you know, it's not the same as being in your studio, but it's the closest you can get, right. you know, by doing it over the internet, by whatever you offer. I don't know if it's videos or, 
everything and and interactive i mean as often as possible if i'm working i was working on a freelance job just uh a few months ago and i wrote all my students everyone everyone who was currently subscribed or signed up for a course whether they had finished the course or not everybody I just wrote them all and i was like hey guys i'm i've got a deadline on monday it's tuesday i'm gonna be working non-stop for the next <laughs> six days here's the here's the link i'm streaming privately for all of you guys if you want to come on watch me work and then I'll be taking breaks every half hour, 45 minutes, and I'll answer questions about what I did. And and we actually just did it again last week, in fact. Um, and we'll, we'll continue to do more of these. But the point is, I was just ripping off this idea of Master Apprentice. It's invaluable. This, this idea of Master Apprentice, it's invaluable. And, you know, own the apprentice space. Absorb everything that you can. Um, you really it's very difficult to reach the next phase without that without because there's so many gaps in learning between oh, yeah. school and like the reality of whatever business you know they're all slightly different yeah learning everything that you can not just the art production which is incredibly important but also just how to interact with the client all that kind of stuff yeah I mean, there's so much stuff i've learned that's helped me write better that's helped me edit better that's helped me plan better blogging by running sites like freelance switch but I've also just learned, you know, how might I plan my own blog and launch my own thing, you know, and I'm, I'm at such a higher point if I was to do that, you know, then, then the darkness of just which can work, you can just sort of just throw, throw something out there and like, you know, it might like catch the tail of a comet or something, but you know, I mean, I've seen it happen, you know, yeah, I'm, right. I'm, you just sort of bumbled your way through and that's how that's how most business is to be honest it's bumbling your way through it's like failing and failing and failing and failing and failing being okay with that and and then you break through you break through on something you know something didn't work and you put freaking 30 hours into it and it's disappointing and get back into the ring you know yeah i I don't know what i would have done without the many mentors that i've had since i was a kid i had great art teachers in elementary middle and high school in fact my middle school art teacher she continued to mentor me all the way through high school and she's an amazing artist communicator teacher um and not just amazing for a middle school art teacher she is amazing as in her work still holds up (laughs) in my eyes uh yeah she's amazing anyway and then i went through a formal art school the Columbus College of Art and Design in Columbus, Ohio, and um, had many mentors there. C.F. Payne, the famous illustrator, he uh, has been very influential in my life, uh, my career. And then when it came time to leave Disney and start my own business, I had zero mentors (laughs) Uh, in business, in, in the business realm. So I had to learn everything from online resources, tutorials, blogs, um, books, and at least business is somewhat more empirical. I cannot imagine trying to learn visual art this way without human mentors that I can talk to. (laughs) Uh, Many, many mentors. It's a whole new thing for you, man. I mean, that's a whole new sphere. I mean, you've you've done the professional illustration thing, but the, you know, launching your own, uh, you know, educational yeah. business, it's, it's a whole new thing, man. Yeah. And it's must be exciting to, to do it. Oh yeah. It's awesome. It's the hardest thing I've ever done, but it's awesome. Uh, I'm, I'm starting to get this uh, sneaking suspicion that I will never willfully make my career easier on myself. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you, man. <laughs> Um, so, uh, I think what we're really saying here is that the, the trend of the culture is mashing your, the, the professional phase up with your learning phase in a way that has never been so confusing in the history of artistic growth. And, uh, you can fight that and we want to inspire you to fight that there comes a time where you move from development phase into engagement phase, you know, where you move from the cocoon into the butterfly. Uh, I cannot think of a more generic metaphor, but there, there you go. You know, it really is. That's an important 
time. Uh, you, you know what happens to the butterfly when it's in the cocoon? It liquefies. And that's what's happening to so many of these artists. They're being forced out of the cocoon before they're a butterfly and they're just like liquid spilling all over the internet. <laughs> <laughs> and then they wonder why they're not getting any reblogs on Tumblr or likes on Facebook or daily deviations on DeviantArt. And it's because it's formless goo. It's undeveloped formless goo. And it's not your fault. It's just not art yet. You, you came out of the cocoon too soon. It's it's not time. It's not time. And, it, and that's not your fault. It, it takes time to become a butterfly. <laughs> I, I just I feel like nobody lets you stay in the cocoon as long as you need to anymore. And I, I want to encourage you to do that because the investments that you make in that time are going to pay off exponentially forever. Now, it might seem frustrating because it's like, oh, I want to be working for the big client or whatever. Oh, man. But if you focus now on being good, all of these horror stories you hear about bad clients and about being super sick of your work and bored with your own work, it's it might not all go away, but you can severely curtail that uh, the, the, the downsides of a creative career. If you really get super good now and you get really focused now and you know what you want and take just take advantage of the cocoon phase. Yeah, man. Yeah. To really develop your skills and just it, it, even a, a little tiny bit of business savvy can go a long way. Yeah. And, you know, we talk about master apprentice, uh, you know, just get a mentor, man, somebody, you know, even more than one mentor, you know, depending on who you can reach out to, you know, um, I think the term mentor may be more familiar nowadays than the term master apprentice, but it's the same thing. You know? Yeah. So let's talk about flakiness, Sean. <laughs> You're definitely speaking to me now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Now, before I get into this, I need to explain that I understand what it's like to be a scatterbrained creative person. I'm easily distracted by shiny objects. I forget stuff all the time. I get it. But I have just had way too many experiences with freelance illustrators who just simply don't communicate. They just go radio silent or they don't take initiative and follow up. Uh, I have to sort of micromanage them. Yeah, I mean, flakiness is just a, a, a great path to failure. I mean, there's, just, there's no yeah. greater path to failure than being flaky. Uh, that said, you can be, you know, quite uh, disorganized and just improve it a little bit over time. Mm -hmm. And what you're pinpointing are the critical areas. I mean, you can slowly like build habits that make you more productive and things like that, but it's absolutely critical that you get work done on time and you know, it's okay. I mean, you know, if one out of a hundred assignments isn't done on time, it, the right. other component you mentioned is communication. You're in constant communication with the client, you know, to the point that they expect, you know, yeah. so you, they, you're keeping them updated. I've, I just got these sketches done. You send them their way for review or whatever your process is. Um, you're on top of each of those checkpoints and you know how long it typically takes you to go from A to Z to get the project done. And the worst thing is when someone doesn't update you. I mean, this happens quite often when I'm hiring new writers to, to write for us. And my inclination, no matter how good it was, is I don't want to work with them again. Uh, I, I may make exceptions here and there if they're right exceptionally well. Few people do. Most people require some coaching before their you know writing is on on task to what we expect. So for me to invest that time, why would I invest that in someone that's not delivering on time? And it doesn't even keep me updated. I mean, I won't. Me too. You know, I'll move on to someone that that I have an opportunity to do that, or I'll yeah. I'll put more time into a writer that that is communicating with me, yep. you know, and yeah, it's just absolutely critical that you communicate with your clients. And that said, if something isn't going to be ready on time, just let them know as soon as possible. Yep. Because I won't hate you or right. think that you're irresponsible or something. If you're not going to deliver on time, because you let me know a week early, I can adjust my schedule. I mean, for me with blogging, I can adjust the schedule. I can move and post stuff that is done. It, you know, it sucks if too many people are doing that at once, or if you do that every single time, right. I may not want to work with you. But if you do it, you know, once in a blue moon, I'm, that happens to everybody, you know? So you just got to keep the client informed. You got to do the best you can to not do that. But if it does happen, just, you know, let them know. 
There's a general guideline by which I have tried to conduct business, and that is to always leave the ball in the client's court. In other words, there's never a time at which the client is waiting on me for something. So if they give me some necessary information, I write back and say, sounds great. I will continue to work on blank until I hear back from you or until I hear otherwise. They always know what I'm doing. They always know what the next milestone is that I'm, I'm working toward. If anyone is going to decide that we need to communicate less, I want it to be the client. So I tend to over communicate, especially when I'm just uh, starting out, when, when it's the, the first time working with a particular client. Yeah, I mean, especially when, as you mentioned, you're establishing uh, this is a new client. You're establishing a new connection with them. Their processes may be slightly different than other clients. It is much better to err on the side of too much information. I mean, you'll find a balance, but it's, it is better to err on that side than to err on the side of not enough. Heck yeah. But then once you've established the relationship, communication can actually get really minimal. Um, but you, you're meeting their needs. And that's all. I mean, the writers that I work with now, there's some that, you know, we, we discuss a lot at the beginning to assign it. They've got a due date. I make sure that due date's two weeks to a month before it actually publishes, you know, I don't need to really hear anything from them until they hand it in, you know? One of the big gripes with freelance illustration is, you know, the client expects me to read their mind. And I've found it to be more the client wants to read my mind. Early on, that was one of the things that kind of cultivated this kind of over communicating uh, habit in me was I realized the more that I just explained to them what I'm doing and explain to them my choices, the more they felt like, oh, he's in control. Uh, yeah. And educating the client. I mean, you got to let them know what your process is if, if they're not an art director, if they're more like a micro business owner and you're doing some illustrations and logo and branding for them. I mean, they have, may have no clue about your process and so you may have to really map it out for them yeah. before you get started. Otherwise, they're going to have a lot of anxiety but by and large some of this mind reading conundrum might be that you're just not talking to the client that you're you're just sitting in your room painting and, and they have no idea what's going on and all of a sudden you send them something that you spent 40 hours on and they haven't seen anything no <laughs> no progress updates or you know that this it might be you yeah it's another business strategy issue i mean basically Let's go back because it's a little easier to discuss the client that isn't savvy. What is your client intake process? Right. You know, um, how are you outlining exactly how you get things done? How long it takes? You can literally map out when they're going to expect to get sketches from the point of signing a yeah. contract, when they're going to expect to get updates. Um, if you've mapped that out, you can even refer to that when you communicate with them. I mean, yeah. you can get specific with these things. If you're working for, for an art director, you, you have to adjust to their process. Right. So it's a little bit different. You have to fit into their workflow and how they do things. You may have to log into their project management app rather than everything running through yours. Right. You know, I mean, there's, there's, they're really different spheres, but in either case, you can get very specific about how you control that process. You know? Yeah. And one, just one last thing on this note, um, because it just came to mind as you were talking here, Sean, um, is don't be afraid there. I, I, especially young artists, I encounter a lot of young artists who don't follow up and don't communicate for irrational fear. They, there's just an irrational, paralyzing fear that has nothing to do with anything. And they just don't they just clam up. They just don't talk at all. They don't communicate. They don't check in just because they're generically afraid. I'm going to be honest. That still happens to me sometimes. Mm. I'll, I'll have one issue and it'll be like the one thing in my inbox I don't want to deal with. And there's literally no good reason why. OK, yeah, it's a bit of a difficult issue, but it's nothing like I haven't done that before. Right. Or dealt with it. But it, it's it's kind of human nature to have certain issues that just strike a chord with you, right. and you can't you can't easily control fear, but you can manage fear. So mm -hmm. it, it might mean you know you you align three major tasks to do for the day. I mean, you're gonna do a bunch of other crap too, but you're at least gonna get these three things done. So put that thing that you've been putting off at the top of your list, you know, just to bang it out and try to get in a mindset that you're able to just do it, even if you feel apprehensive about it, you know, just get through it. You know, for me, sometimes I get a more problematic e email than usual in my inbox. And for some reason it, it just 
strike some kind of chord and I right. feel, <laughs> you know, like it's the last thing I want to yeah. deal with. And, you know, it's not even necessarily aligning with what I think is my most yeah. important <laughs> thing to do, but it's, it's urgent or it has to get dealt with. So I'm just, you know, turn my email program off and they're like, I'll deal with this at lunchtime. And then, you know, after lunch, yeah, I still don't want to deal with it, but you just have to make it important. Put it at the top of your to-do list and just bang it out. Yeah. uh, My most productive time is my first four hours of the day. And so therefore I try and always use that time uh, on the most important stuff. But then there's this constant, uh, multiple times a week, this constant conflict of the time that I'm most able to deal with the stuff that I don't like about the job is in that time as well. Cause I have the most energy and I'm the most brave yeah. and on and on. So that's just a constant kind of push and pull the tug of war of that. That's so insightful to say that's when you're the most brave. I mean, I can so relate to that. You know, I, I want to be the most creative. I want to do my own personal writing and then yeah. I want to do my most critical editing, you know, where I'm literally like rewriting some passages and really being insightful yep. with the, the stuff that I'm editing. I want to do all that kind of more creative work early on. But at the same time, there's, there's some business issues that come up that really require the same level of mental yeah. uh, effort <laughs> and plus bravery. Like what you're saying, like, you know, if you're feeling apprehensive, you have to be like, you know, you got to, you know, put your Rocky suit on or whatever. <laughs> exactly. So let's move on to the last big reason freelance artists fail. And that's the general inability to affect a very specific, clear art direction into one's professional work. So to take notes, make changes and make the changes that the client is asking for uh, or, or more specifically, the art director is asking for. This is what you should have been walked through during school and kind of done it. Like in design school, we would put our stuff up and we would critique it. Yep. And then teacher would, we get a direction, we go and fix it with clients. It's more specific because it could be like you used a, a world war two helmet. That's got the spike on it. And yeah, okay. That's actually the, the allies, but it just reminds people of, you know, the Nazis or something, even though technically it's not and whatever it is. I mean, some marketing guy could throw a red flag and you've got to adjust. So can you do that? I mean, can you separate your art and bring in the, that business um, savvy where that that's what you're being hired to do. You're being hired for your ability to adjust to this criticism. And it doesn't mean you have to be walked over all the time either. You may have some insight back probably less so early on because you don't have that confidence, but you know, someone may give you advice and you may be able to come back to them a little bit, but yeah, ultimately you have to be able to have that kind of conversation and put it at the forefront of importance because it is it is at the forefront of importance. If you're not able to adjust to that, you're not a professional. Yeah. I mean, you're just not a professional illustrator. I mean, you you may be very good at your craft, but you're not good at like the business. Right. Yeah. You know? So, yeah, and I think that for one, the more professional you get, the less you care about fighting changes in a way because you're the more professional you get the more you separate your professional from your personal work and it's not that you become apathetic about your professional work it's just that you realize that that work belongs to the client and i think this gets you called back a lot is when you're sort of in a way you're kind of the advocate for the client um now again this doesn't work when there's no trust this doesn't work when it's a bad client uh go to chrisoli.com forward slash bad dash clients for more on that but trusting that it's a good client or it's a pretty good client you're providing for them a service and i think there's a difference too in changes like you gave there sean which is a very specific we just need to change the helmet that's more of a pragmatic note but there's also the very difficult and more kind of foggy uh, area of the art direction art is very subjective yeah. so you know who's really right there i mean does it really right. matter i mean are they requiring you to completely restart the design and then you or the illustration you should be charging them for that but if just asking you to change a few um colors or something like that you really can't be married to your work right. and not be flexible with that kind of thing you know they may have real reasons for that and they may articulate to the, them to you when they're not, then they are a difficult client. But if there's, they're explaining a reason, I mean, it's a little easier to, to adjust to that. But in either case, you know, you have to decide if you want to work with them or not. And if you want to get paid. Yeah. And, and it, it's important to note that we're 
in all of these things, in the flakiness thing, in the in the note taking thing, unless we specifically address the bad client issue, we're talking about good clients or acceptable clients. And here it's the same thing. You know, there actually is a great Tumblr uh, called Clients from Hell that is hilarious. It's so funny. It's super entertaining because they just basically post sections of emails sent to illustrators or designers that are just, you know, the worst art direction ever. And we've all been in those situations. So granted, that's that's not a fun situation to be in. And again, that's a whole other podcast. But even if the client doesn't get that at first, really, it's as simple as just continuing to ask questions that direct everyone to an actionable, deliverable result. So sure, the 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 conversation can start in an abstract way, but you can ask questions and continue to kind of just dog the conversation until you get down to, OK, so here's what, what I think you're saying. I'll do these one, two, three specific things to the illustration and then send it back to you. Right. We're all on the same page. The clearer the brief, the better the results you're going to get because they're going to be very targeted. Yeah. You know, I mean, so if you're working with another client, you're the one that's going to have to put the brief together. You're the one that's going to have to walk them through that process. If you've got an art director, they're more likely to give you something that's more specific in nature and what they're looking for, um, which gives you a great direction to run in. And with some art directors, you, you're going to get feedback that actually improves the work. On a, you know, as much as you'll get feedback that you're like kind of unsure of or not feeling it as much. Um, but yeah, I've seen art direction make the work even better. You know, because it just uh, took it to another level. It's basically just setting certain requirements. And if the work isn't quite meeting those and they articulate why, then the artist is just taking it that much further. So, yeah, yeah, you need a really good brief and you need to put it together and work from that. You briefly mentioned art school critiques, and that is a great way to practice and to learn how to take art direction notes. And that's one of the main problems with these random forums where half the people are being buttheads and just ripping it apart. That's not professionalism. It's not professional practice. What you need is a circle of trust and ideally a circle of trusted fellow students who understand, clearly understand where you want to go what your goals are, what your aspirations are, and they are going to give you specific critique that will help you get there. Uh, critique and encouragement. And whether you go to Oatly Academy, uh, our school, or you go somewhere else to one of the other strong online schools out there, or even one of the big expensive physical schools, or you set up your own circle of trust in person or online, I cannot emphasize strongly enough the importance of uh, professional practice within a trusted circle of professionally minded artists. The buttheads in the forums are not helping you. And I don't know a single professional, uh, successful professional artist who will say that, oh, yeah, that was that made all the difference. Just having my work ripped apart by some stranger who was probably 12 years old. Yeah, it's a conversation. I mean, it has to be between two people that are aligned for the same goals. I've been in classes that have been excellent like everyone put their illustration up and like you're saying they understand kind of what you're going for in your style and they're encouraging with their criticism and it's actually moving you in a better direction you can go back to the little drawing board redraw it with a whole like better focus and i've been in design classes where everyone's just kind of like uh, hammering on each other without any real support more like they're competing you know where it's not nurturing it's not like growing it's not focused on you know improving it's just kind of hacking at each other and that i could definitely see happening in a lot of forums you know you really need early on a mentor like this or or something that kind of relationship where someone will give you very poignant advice helpful advice that's not like just hacking and being like you don't know how to use a paintbrush or whatever right. i think what we're saying is the, the bad situations are inevitable, but the problem is with the Internet and everything and the kind of our new culture that we're living in artistically, the bad situations are often the only thing that you've, you're finding yourself in. And that's terrible. That's no way to learn and it's no way to be prepared. And in fact, you have to take control of the situation. You have to get the small group, again, the circle of trust, or you have to find just like Sean saying, find the mentor and, you know, ideally a mentor that's kind of taking you through an educational, a, a really effective educational 
educational program. You know, those are the places where you're going to learn to see. And when you know how to see, then when you're back in the client ambiguity, then you're going to be so much more confident because you'll be able to like like uh, Indiana Jones at the end of Last Crusade, you know, where he finally takes the leap of faith and, you know, he can and all of a sudden the bridge appears under his feet. It's that same kind of thing. It's like you'll be able to kind of take that first step and then all of a sudden you'll see the bridge. You'll see the way to cross the gap of ambiguity and get to the other side. And that makes you incredibly rehirable. I mean, when you can do that, when you can close those ambiguous gaps, you are magic you're you're a wizard yeah and the more you go through the process of you and like maybe a couple of other people critiquing your work you will get to the point that you can hang up your work maybe not immediately after you've drawn it but you know right. go grab a coffee and come back look at it with some level of fresh eyes and and you can critique it as though someone else was doing it you know you can get objective with your own work and find you know what are the flaws what do i need to do to improve this what do i need to practice very true Sean, would you please uh, share with the listeners where they can find you online? Yeah, I mean, I'm on Twitter, Sean Hodge on Twitter. Um, I'm developing my own space to kind of help people with the micro business stuff more on a personal level. Nice. I've got the space called creatro.com, C-R-E-A-T-R-O.com. And, you know, it's, it's really people with this kind of creative background and mentality just wanted to to make moves online. Well, I will link to uh, both Sean's Twitter account and creatro.com as well uh, in the show notes accompanying this podcast episode. Sean, thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been incredibly inspiring. Thanks for having me, man. Great to meet you. Likewise. And good luck to everybody. Be sure to visit chrisoatley.com forward slash freelance dash artists. Scroll down to the learn more section where you'll find links to our other freelancing resources, including part one of this interview with Sean Hodge. In the last episode, we introduced a new Q&A segment, and it was, as I was hoping, a big hit with the ArtCast audience. Today, we introduce yet another new segment, The Breakthrough. Today's breakthrough story comes from Eva Maria Toker. One of Eva's paintings was recently featured in Imagine Effects magazine, the digital art uh, magazine that it's huge. It's a huge deal. And so we're very proud of her. Eva writes, I started getting seriously into illustration as a career choice just over a year ago, but for quite a while, I had a really hard time answering the question, what do you do? I would freeze up, and although I wanted to say, I'm an illustrator, it just didn't come out. Sometimes I would say, I'm an illustrator, but I haven't really done anything notable. It was pretty frustrating. Getting my work into the Imagine Effects FX Pose section gave me a lot more confidence about my work. Just seeing it printed on the pages of a magazine somehow made it more real. Taking Chris Oatley's Magic Box course, among others, helped me get my work to a level where I was comfortable even submitting it to Imagine Effects. I also learned a lot of really valuable Photoshop tricks from Chris that I use every day in my work. Specifically, I think that my way of rendering light has improved a lot thanks to the Magic Box, and it's great to finally be able to tell people that I'm an illustrator without having to feel like a fake. <laughs> oh. You can find Eva's Imagine Effects painting in the post that accompanies this podcast episode at chrisoatley.com forward slash freelance dash artists. That's chrisoatley.com forward slash freelance dash artists, and that's artists plural. You can find more of Eva's work at evamariatoker.com. If one of our podcasts, our blog, our interactions at a convention, or one of our Oatly Academy courses has helped you to achieve an artistic or professional breakthrough, you can share your own breakthrough story through our easy upload form at chrisoatley.com forward slash breakthrough. That's chrisoatley.com forward slash breakthrough. So visit that link, share your breakthrough story via text or audio, and perhaps we'll share it on an upcoming episode of the ArtCast. Be sure to include the link to your website, blog, Deviant Art Gallery online portfolio, whatever you prefer, so we can share the love with a link. And if you'd like to learn more about the Magic Box, our digital painting course, the one Eva just mentioned, you can head to chrisoatley.com forward slash magic box.